Uh, make sure you have your Bibles open there to Genesis 4. Turn back to page 3. We're going to continue our series here in Genesis. And, and when Mickey was putting this series together, he, he took this passage, he looked at it, and he gave it the title, A Bloody World. It's like the Aussie sermon. But I, I, I wouldn't use such language normally in church, but it is quite a fitting title for this passage. It is a bloody world. Now, we've looked at Genesis 1 to 3 the past few weeks, and we've had this beautiful painting of God with his people in the garden. And then in Genesis 3, we see Adam and Eve rebel against God, like they're tearing the painting off the wall, and they're defacing it. And in chapter 4, we're, we're stepping outside the garden. We're, we're getting a view of life outside the garden for the first time. And we see this first generation born into this world of rebellion against God. And we're wondering, what's going to happen? What will it be like? Maybe, maybe sin isn't that bad. Maybe things will go okay. Well, this passage relieves us of any such illusion. This chapter is a bloody mess that kickstarts a bloody world. And I'm sorry if you came to church hoping for something upbeat this morning, but we, we just don't get it here in Genesis 4. Instead, in this passage, we see sin spreading and we see sin amplifying. We see man under God's judgment, guilty, desperate. And it's the same today. Human nature hasn't changed this is the story of our first parents, and it's a story of us. We only need to look to the newspapers. We live in a bloody world still. We only have to look to our own hearts. Even if we haven't murdered someone like Cain, there's the same hatred in our own hearts. So our first point is Cain's descent. And have a look at chapter 4, verse 1 with me. It says... Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now for such a dark chapter, it actually begins here on a hopeful note. Eve's excited here. She's gotten a man. I think after she was exiled from the garden, Eve believed in God's promises, and she repented. And here she's remembered God's promise to bruise the head of the serpent through her offspring, remember chapter 3, verse 15? And she's thinking, this is it. I've gotten a man. This is the promised offspring. God's going to fix the mess that Adam and I made. But then verse 3 is where the descent starts. And if you wanted to trace Cain's descent, it goes first false worship, then anger and dejection, then murder, then cover up and lies. And it's significant that it starts with false worship because it's our wrong relationship with God that means we have wrong relationships with each other. So look at verse 3 and we see the false worship. It says, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Now this passage, it tells us so much in such a brief amount of space, and the Bible is actually quite brilliant like that. But it means we're only given clues of what was wrong with Cain's offering. And the first clue is that it says Abel brought the firstborn and fat portions of his flock. These are the most valuable parts of the most valuable animals. But did you notice there's no comment about Cain's offering? It's like he, he just brought what was lying around. But it's not just the quality of the offering. It's not just like that Abel went to the choice meat section of Harris Farms and, 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 and Cain just went to, you know, the free kids producing coals. No, it's, it's not just the quality. It's the heart that stands behind each offering. And we see Cain's heart actually at the end of verse 5 with his response to God's rejection. Did you see? Cain gets angry and his face fell and he became dejected. Now, anger is a very strong reaction. It's, it's the response of someone who thinks that he deserves better. See, see Cain, 
he treats God like a vending machine. You know, you put in the sacrifice and out comes the blessing. And he's bitterly disappointed that that's not how it turns out. He's angry with God, like the man banging the vending machine, frustrated. He's angry with the image of God standing next to him, Abel. He's jealous. He's dejected. And this is the big problem with Cain's offering. It's not primarily about what is offered. It's the heart behind the offering. Cain comes to God like it's a transaction. It's wanting God's stuff again, but not wanting God himself. It's false worship. And isn't that false worship of Cain inside each of our hearts as well? Where we come to God not for a relationship with him, but just to get something out of him. And then we get angry with God or disappointed with God because he doesn't come through with what we were hoping for. I mean, you see it most clearly with the prosperity gospel. You know, you, you sacrifice by giving your money and then you believe God will bless you with more money coming back. That, it's the religion of Cain. Or you see it in more traditional forms of Christian ritual. Like, if you do the right ceremonies, you say the right prayers, then God might be happy with you. But we can do it as evangelicals as well. You know, if you do your quiet time each day, if you come to church each Sunday, then maybe God will be happy with you. It might not be treating God like a vending machine, but it's kind of, it's treating God like he's a, a combination lock that you've got to break into. And if you get the right combination of rituals right, then maybe God's blessings will flow out on you. It's the religion of Cain. It's the false worship that Jesus talked about when he said, these people, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. See, that's what God wants. He wants our hearts. That's why Hebrews 11.4, it says, Abel offered a better sacrifice because he offered it with faith. Again, it's fascinating. The descent of Cain starts with false worship. Jesus said the two greatest commandments are to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor. And when we fail to do the first, of course we fail to do the second. Like I mentioned, the next step in Cain's descent is anger and dejection at the end of verse 5. See, if Cain knew the Lord wasn't pleased, the, the right response, it's not anger. The right response is to get on your knees. Say, I'm sorry, Lord. Help me to do better next time. That's not Cain's response. Instead, he gets angry. And again, it's inside each of us. We get angry with God because, well, we think we deserve better from Him. We get angry with other people because we think we deserve better than them. It, this, this entitlement, this sense of I deserve something more from God, it's at the heart of so much of our sin. When really if we stopped and think, if we stopped and thought about it, we'd go, actually, I just deserve God's judgment. That's, that's what I've merited. See, things haven't changed since Cain. Human nature hasn't changed. There's this creeping covetousness in each of us that says, I deserve better, and gets angry when we don't get what we want. Yet God is so gracious to Cain. He mercifully speaks to him, and he directs him in verse 6. Look at, with, look at it with me. God says to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? God's like a counselor here. He's asking Cain questions. You know, what lies behind your anger? What, what lies behind your fallen face? Isn't that it, isn't it you think you deserve better? Isn't that the f problem in the first place? And then he uses this powerful image in verse 7. Sin is like a, a wild animal crouching outside your door, ready to pounce, take you over completely. Now Luke Shooter showed me a video last night. And it is quite an interesting video, I suppose. It's of a, of a snowboarder, and she's clipping herself into the snowboarder at the top of the slope. And she's got a GoPro to film herself, and so you can see her and you can see behind her, but she can't see behind her. And as she's clipping in, she's got her headphones on, listening to some tunes, you notice that there's a bear, big bear, crouching about 30 metres behind her. 
And then as she takes off down the slope, the bear pounces and starts chasing her down the slope. And she's oblivious, got no idea. She's just cruising. Thankfully, about halfway down the slope, the bear gives up the chase and she gets down safely. Didn't fall over or anything. That's what sin's like, isn't it? It's just there. We, so often we don't realize it, but it's crouching, it's ready to pounce. And when it does, it's like there's this crazed, irrational animal inside all of us. And we feel it. Sometimes it just grabs hold and it, and it overrides any kind of logical train of thought. It's twisted. Maybe we don't go as far as Cain. Maybe we don't kill anyone. But I know in me there have been times anger's grabbed hold and I have thought some terrible thoughts. Jesus said you murder your brother when you're angry with him. And the animal sin is crouching in each of us and God is saying to Cain, you need to master it. Don't open the door. It's crouching. Stop the anger. Do what's right. But Cain rejects God's call. He gives in to his anger. He opens the door and sin pounces. Now, something terrible is happening here. Eve, remember, she rejoiced in Cain's birth, hoping here, here he is, the promised serpent-crushing offspring. But now, tragically, he becomes the offspring of the serpent who strikes out at the woman's offspring. It's like when Anakin Skywalker becomes Darth Vader. The line of the serpent, it's begun with Cain. So we've seen false worship in Cain's descent. Then we've seen anger and dejection, and now comes murder. Verse 8, if you look at it, it's very spare in detail. Just as Cain spoke to his brother Abel, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. We don't know how he killed his brother. It says his blood was spilled, called out to God from the ground. Maybe he was stabbed, maybe he was bludgeoned. We don't know, but in verse 8, we have the first human death in the Bible. And it's not Adam and Eve dying in old, you know, ripe old age. No, the first death in the Bible is murder. It's fratricide. What started with false worship, it ends with this bloody mess, this, this bloody world. But even after the murder, God is still gracious and long-suffering. Can you believe it? Look at verse 9. It says, Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? Now, God knows all things. He knows where Abel is. It's like last week with Adam and Eve. He's giving Cain an opportunity to confess. But look at Cain's response at the end of verse 9. He says, I do not know. I do not know. It's a flat-out lie. And this is the last part of Cain's descent, trying to cover up, trying to lie, like like he can hide it from God. Just so stupid. You can't hide anything from God, the one who knows all. But again, don't we do the same? Don't we try to hide our sin, pretend it's not there? Hope the, hope the years will cover it over. Or, or we pretend it's not really sin. Or we, we self-justify it. Or we hope God won't notice. It's stupid. But it's the spirit of Cain that lies in each of us. Cain says sarcastically, am I my brother's keeper? Like, what do you expect, God? Do you want me to follow him around like Abel follows his sheep around? It's just a deflection. He's attempting to change the subject. And God, he has none of his lies in verse 10. Look at it with me. The Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground interesting Abel doesn't speak a single word in the Bible and yet his blood cries out to God and the point is that God knows he always knows and he cares he cares enough about evil that he responds with righteous justice and this is our second big heading Cain's sentence we've we've seen Cain's descent now we're seeing Cain's sentence and we're looking at verses 11 to 16 there are two elements to Cain's sentence. The first, he's cursed from the ground, verse 11. The, the ground won't bear its strength to Cain like it did before. It's, it's like the ground is a constant reminder to him of the blood that he has poured into it. 
And second, at the end of verse 12, God sentences Cain to exile. He'll be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, directionless, afraid, meaningless, scavenging what food he can. It's a terrible judgment. It's, it's like the outer darkness of hell. In verse 13, Cain speaks up. And we want to hear some sign of remorse, some apology for what he's done to his brother. But still, all he cares about is himself. He says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And once again, God is merciful. He puts a, a mark on Cain. And somehow it stops people attacking him so that God can put a, a stop to the cycle of vengeance. And then the final words of this section, they're haunting. Look at verse 16. It says, Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. It's like a preview of hell. Away from the source of all that is good, all that is true, all that is beautiful. Away from the source of light and life and love. Away from the presence of God. It's a difficult passage, isn't it? We've seen Cain's descent We've seen Cain sentenced. But what do we need to make of it? I think, I think one thing is we just need to recognize the horrible reality of sin in our world. Sin is terrible. As we, as we come outside the garden, it's just spreading and it's amplifying. This is what happens when we turn our backs on God. It's a bloody world. And like the blood of Abel crying out, God knows all about the sin and injustice of this world. And this is good news because it means that ultimately there will be justice. You know, there's people who, who complain about God or say, God's not there because look at all the evil around us. And the fact is that God knows about the evil. He's just patient with sinners like us to turn back to him. He will do justice. The blood cries out, and it's good news that he will. It's good news that God cares about the evil in this world. You know, you think of the horrendous rates of domestic abuse in our country and those silenced screams behind closed doors. God hears them. You think of human trafficking. It's highest levels in history vulnerable children taken into slavery. God hears their tears. You think of refugees forced from their homes by warmongers. God hears them sobbing in their tents at night. Closer to home, you think of our country, you think of its settlement. We live in Cain's bloody world. We can't escape it. Actually, no society has escaped it. You think of the blood still spilled in our city today. And we, we like to think of our city that there's not much bloodshed here. But the reality is our city is stained with the blood of family members. Not spilled on soil like Abel, but spilled on disinfected floors in clinics. Thousands of family members sacrificed every day before they're born. God heard the blood of Abel and he hears it today. And you can imagine the chorus would be deafening. We do live in a bloody world. And none of it goes unnoticed. He will do justice. Like I said, it's good news that God will do justice when we consider the evil in this world. But it's very frightening news when we remember the evil in our own hearts. See, see, maybe we've sinned like Cain. Maybe we've even murdered. And maybe we've been able to hide it from other human beings at least. It's not hidden from God. Or maybe our sin is more respectable than Cain's sin. You know, not murder, but, but cheating on that test. Or lying in that email. Or fudging on that number or sleeping with that person, or exploiting that employee, or viewing that video, or holding that hatred in the heart. You know, it's not hidden from God. 
injustice cries out to him. Sin has spread since Cain. It's amplified and it infects every single human heart. It infects our hearts. And without Christ, we're like Cain in so many ways. We're out of God's presence, wandering through life without any real direction or meaning or hope. And we can try to get angry with God like Cain did. It just leads to further sin. We can try to hide it from God like Cain did. Like Lady Macbeth pretending she can wash the blood off her hands. We can try to pretend that that sin isn't important. But we're we're just lying to ourselves. And, And God knows better. God knows. We're guilty. We deserve God's judgment. It's a dark chapter. But it's the chapter that we're all involved in. There's a small mercy there in the mark of Cain. We don't know what the sign is exactly. But it's a little hint of the mercy that is to come that is so much greater and that we really desperately need. The, the only hope that we have is through the blood of Jesus. It really is. We're all in this problem of Cain together. The Bible says the blood of Jesus, it speaks a better word than Abel. You know, the, the, the blood of Abel spilled on the ground and it cries out sin. It cries out murder. Jesus' blood spilled on the ground and it cries out forgiveness. It cries out life. It's the blood of Jesus. It's only the blood of Jesus that can cover the guilty souls of sinners like me and you. Without him, we are desperate, wandering under that same judgment as Cain, Jesus is our only hope in this bloody world. His is the blood of the truly innocent victim. We had that second Bible reading. Let his friend betray him, turn on him. You know, his own countrymen, his brothers, murder him, the truly innocent one, shed his blood. But what did Jesus say about his blood in that passage? He said, it's the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It's that blood where our hope is found. I said at the beginning, you've got that beautiful picture of Genesis 1 and 2. Defaced now, torn off the wall. Nick Ward mentioned a similar image last week at 5pm of uh, vandalism in in London. Similar similar case. Picture being torn torn off the wall. And the next morning there was a sign there that said this can be restored this can be restored and with us in a genesis chapter 4 world the hope of restoration is it's hopeless it's not there but with jesus it truly can be restored he is the one who can bring us back back into the presence of god let's pray Now, Father in heaven, we, we just desperately need Jesus. We know our sin. We know we live in a bloody world. We know our hearts are guilty. The blood is on our hands, and we need the blood of Jesus to cover us. And so please, Father, through his precious blood, forgive us and transform us to live a life under his good lordship. It's in his name we pray. Amen.